fifth principle is to identify the legal standard for determining fitness. Now, this is really easy to say, but this is, I think, an emerging uh, issue in our profession. Um, it's one that was recently uh, brought to light in the revision of the Fitness for Duty Evaluation Guidelines by the IACP Police Psychological Services section. The IACP guidelines, as you may know, for the uh, Police Psychological Services section are, reside, are, are revised quintennially. The last one was in 2005, was done again in 2009, it'll be done again in 2014, every five years. In 2004, this was the definition of a fitness for duty evaluation. A psychological fitness for duty evaluation is a formal specialized examination of an incumbent employee that results from one, objective evidence that the employee may be unable to safely or effectively perform a defined job, and two, a reasonable basis for believing that the cause may be attributable to, and the red letters were the 2004 language, psychological factors. Now let's stop there for a moment. Can you think of any situation in which an employee's behavior as a police officer, particularly impaired performance, problematic performance, doesn't derive from psychological factors? Can you think of any situation? Don't psychological factors underlie all bad behavior, right? Peeve, disrespect, uh, resentment, um, lack of motivation, uh, not liking one's career, burned out, you seem perplexed. The That's what I'm saying. <laughs> psychological yeah. factors. The person's an asshole. What is this? Is that a psychological of course it's a psychological. They're, they're psychological factors. It's not necessarily a Absolutely. It's there could also be medical reasons. reasons. My point is, psychological factors is so broad that there is no way we could ever conclude that the problematic behavior that served as the basis for the referral was independent of psychological factors. Right. So the employee is toast from the beginning because we're going to say, here are the psychological factors that led to this behavior. And if that behavior is unacceptable in the agency, then ipso facto, the employee is unfit for duty. I can't tell you as an expert witness how many times I have seen this occur, that an employee has been found unfit for duty for reasons that have to do with resentment or as Elizabeth so eloquently said, because he's an asshole. <laughs> I'm so glad I get to defer to you. So, with the. Huh? Well, in fertility, thank you so much. And, 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 and this is the beauty of having the guidelines outside of the American Psychological Association, an, agent, uh, an organization that I, I believe strongly in and, and value. Um, I know many of you don't share that more positive <laughs> assessment. But because it is a. a um, a layperson organization, chiefs of police, we have a professional section within it of psychologists, we're able to get these guidelines done in two years. It would take nine with the American Psychological Association. I don't think there's a guideline published by the APA that has taken less than seven years. So by the time it gets published, we into the next We're we, we view the world differently. Yeah. Okay, so here's what it now says. It says more than that. There we go. A psychological fitness for duty evaluation, blah, 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 attributable to a psychological condition or impairment. Now, this was the result of great compromise language. Great compromise language. And I don't think we're done with it. I'd make it even stronger. 
So I'm going to simply talk about, because I, I, I happen to be the guy who gets to teach this class. So I'm going to share with you what my perspective is. And I, just as when, in the prior discussion, I respect, honestly appreciate the fact that there are different points of view on this. I just have a different one. And that is this. I don't think, I think it is entirely, let me say it this way, I think it's entirely disingenuous, disingenuous of us when we acknowledge that federal law and state progeny require a reasonable suspicion of a mental health condition in order to do the evaluation, that we then do the evaluation, find no medical condition, but still conclude the person's unfit for duty. I don't think that's right, but it's done routinely will say, the person has no disability, the person has no underlying mental health condition, no access one, no access two, but they, uh, you know, they're really angry, they've got really poor interpersonal skills, they really don't deal well with others, they don't play well with others, they don't cooperate really well, he's full of hostility, he's not psychologically fit for duty. He's impulsive. That's not a conclusion I would reach. If, if all of those things being true, my conclusion would simply be the person does not meet the definition for fitness for duty. This is not a medical issue. This is a performance issue. Deal with it. Fire them. Say it another way. Or discipline them. Train them. Segregate them. Say it another way. If it doesn't take a psychologist to assess it, don't use it as the basis for a fitness judgment. A police officer, a police chief, a police lieutenant, a, 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 an attorney, a human resource uh, employee is as capable of defining and recognizing an asshole as I am. <laughs> so if that's the problem, then use that as the basis for personnel action. Yes, Rand. <clears throat> Rand points out that they are not capable of, 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 of assessing or recognizing or determining a psychological condition. Exactly. That's why the fitness for duty evaluation has to be done. And we either rule one in or we rule it out. We either identify it or we don't. I'm saying my position is if I find no mental health condition, and by that I mean an axis one or axis two condition, if I don't find one, that person is not going to be found unfit for duty. I don't care how bad his behavior is, how much I believe he shouldn't be a cop, how much I believe that he's going to create problems down the future, maybe even problems involving safety. What I'm, what I'm going to say is, here are the problems with this police officer that you have articulated to me. Those problems, in my opinion, derived from non-medical factors. The person has no psychological condition. <clears throat> Deal with it administratively. There is no underlying fitness problem. Yes? But the behaviors or description that you enunciated sounds a lot like a personality disorder. Maybe, maybe not. If I determine that it is, if it's, in my opinion there is a personality disorder, then I would say so, and I would use that as a basis for a finding that the person's unfit for duty. I believe access to disorders qualify, certainly as a mental condition. But Joe, it's, it's, it's probably not an access to condition if in a 37-year-old employee, it just started last year. Because by definition, when did a personality disorder begin? How long has it been in existence? Since early adulthood, that's right. So if, if it just occurred, this is a change in behavior it's probably because of some other issue, if there's no underlying mental condition, such as got passed over for, for promotion, uh, the coworker was having an affair with his wife, um, you know, any number of things. Yes, <laughs> Susie. So I'm reconciling that with the, uh, as we talked about yesterday, 1031F and the post yes. guidelines. At the pre-employment stage, we don't need an access one or an access two. No. Who's qualified, but then we're sort of pulling forward that they still need to maintain the requirements of 1031F. So the bar could be a little, a little fuzzy, the, California anyway. 
Well, I don't think it is. Uh, not, we're going to come to this one in just a second. The, the question is because 1031F and post, the post Big Ten remain on the table at all times throughout the person's career, it gets a little fuzzy because you could be disqualified on the post 10 for reasons that are non-medical. I absolutely agree with you, but I don't think that implicates fitness, and I'll talk about why in a moment. Um, a question on yes, the um, administrative, they need to deal with this administratively. Are you making that clear in the report? I make that clear in the report, okay. that th these are issues that you can comfortably deal with administratively without fear of an ADA issue, because I find you can't have a disability if there's no underlying medical or mental condition. You you still don't necessarily have a disability just because you have a mental condition. You know, mental conditions don't equal disability. Disability is a legal determination based upon the impact of that condition on the person's ability to perform the functions of the job, the, uh, the impact it has in their life. Again, ADA AA makes that rather moot because the presumption now is always that they have a disability. So uh, I, I think it's safe to say under the ADA AA, if they have a condition, they'll be regarded as having a disability under the ADA. But nonetheless, the question for fitness purposes is not whether they have a mental condition. It's a two-step process. First, do they have a mental condition? If the answer to that is no, we're done. There's no fitness issue. If they do, the second step is What's the impact of that condition on their ability to safely and effectively perform the duties of the job? And there was a discussion on the listserv a couple of weeks ago, Tom, you may have followed this one that I had with, uh, with one of our colleagues uh, who asserted that if a person has a, if a police officer has a diagnosis of PTSD, he cannot be qualified. I, I, I completely disagree with that. I agree with that. Uh, there are plenty of police officers who are functioning with PTSD, whose symptoms are adequately managed. Uh, I think it's a gross violation of the ADA to terminate on the basis of a diagnosis or disqualify on the basis of a diagnosis as opposed to the impact of that diagnosis. 